not quite one fourth and never just half, but the entirety of one primate, whole. It is the part of a story, an idea that means more to you than me. Hello and welcome to Full Gorilla Life. We are Jeremy Keen, Larry Medina, and Corey Hewlings. Each week, we will break down an important life concept or talk with an inspiring person so that you can live your full gorilla life. All right, we'd like to welcome you back to our podcast. And today we have the privilege of talking with Brett and Felice Hockey, who are from the Regenerative Biological Institute. And uh, what they do there is age management, health optimization. My understanding is that there's a lot of different names, a lot, a lot of different things that we could that it could be that it could go by, right? Yep, absolutely. All right. Now, before we get too far into it, right, uh, we would like to start off with our quick gorilla gauntlet so we can get to know each other. We're gonna have double answers. On a we're gonna get to level. know both of you. Okay. So there's no complaints about who's talking more. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, we'll do one then the other. Okay. Whoever wants to go Perfect. first. Okay. Right. <laughs> they both pointed at each other just ladies first okay. okay i was gonna say right married or single don't lie married. <laughs> okay. uh, is this a question do i think you should be married or single maybe you want to separate well, us out before we, we uh, get, the, get the truth here man uh, uh any children yes how many three city you live in zero iphone or android iphone Favorite movie or book? Ooh. Uh, actually, It's a Wonderful Life is my favorite movie. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, see, he has an unfair advantage, though, because now he's listening, now right? Now he knows. Yeah, That's he knows. That's a good yeah. It's really the gauntlet for me, <laughs> but not for him. Copy Reservation or just walk in? Say that again? Reservation or just totally walk in? I know the answer for her. Oh, walk in. I walk in? Oh. <laughs> favorite type of food? Maybe. <laughs> sushi, although I never get to eat it. So like raw fish sushi or like oh uh, combo white girl sushi bento box. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> bento box. White girl sushi. Is that white girl sushi? That's I don't know. I don't. I don't myself. I don't know the definition. It's of that like one. no uncooked fish. Okay, like oh, no, no, I'm no, having no. sushi. I do raw fish. Okay. Absolutely. Um. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Uh, what type of car do you drive? A suburban. Beer, whiskey, or wine? I'm going to go with wine. White or red? White. All right. Married or single? Married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Better answer. Yeah, I was going to say answer right. correctly yeah, here, right. buddy. You know, come on, guys. We'll skip <laughs> over these. Yeah, right. Uh, iPhone or Android for you? iPhone. Favorite movie or book? Book of Eli. Okay. It's a great movie. Great movie, man. Great movie. Great movie. Uh, favorite genre of music? Uh, outlaw country. Did I skip? I skipped that for you, didn't you I? You did. What's your favorite genre uh, of music? Gosh, I'm really eclectic. I can't. An- I can't answer that. I feel the same way. I really can't yeah. pick one. And what do you mean by outlaw country? Who is outlaw country? Yeah, oh, man, what a great question. Is, is that uh, serious? Yeah, it is. I was gonna say this can open up a whole other thing. Some, you should have a whole separate podcast dedicated <laughs> to outlaw country. Um, I would say it, it. It's these are the okay so. If you go to the the country artists now, there's a lot of people that sort of toe the line. They're kind of uh, pop. Yes. Uh, they don't even really sound country a lot of times. There's no soul in the music. Um, you know, I want to hear Johnny Cash singing live at San Quentin. Yeah, See, that's Cash. what I'm right? saying. And do you call Cash country? He, well, he calls a, it outlaw country. A, okay, so I'll tell you a great Because I'm a big Cash fan. He is a, he's a transcendent figure that, that, that speaks his message. From a country platform. Okay. Okay, so like, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, we had uh, what were called third country nationals, and they would clean our, our uh, hospital. And uh, they were, you know, they were contractors, and these guys were from Bangladesh. And when we would play music, you know, we'd, we'd be playing off of our, our iPads or whatever. We'd, we'd have speakers, and they, they knew, generally speaking, they knew Michael Jackson and they knew Elvis, right? Because those, okay. those two, that, that's America exports Michael Jackson and Elvis. So I played for them some Johnny Cash. And they understood English to the point where they could they could under, understand the lyrics. All they wanted to hear was Johnny Cash. Because it's a it's a message. It's a, it's a, the lyrics are sort of a universal message 
and it's something that resonated with them. So that's, that's all they ever they play. Johnny Cash, play Johnny Cash, Cash. is king. Baby. So, so right. for the folks that don't know Johnny Cash, what is the one song that, that you think that they should listen to? What? A, uh, oh man, man, oh, man. God. God. I say that. I, I would say Falls in Prison, but I'm a car guy, so I love One Piece at a Time. One like, Piece at a Time. I'm just like, that's uh, because I'm a car guy. Yeah. Uh, gosh, man, yep. what, a, what a great question, dude. What a great <laughs> question. Um, I would say, I would Boy say, Named Sue. A Boy Named Sue. Oh, God, okay, that's so a good that, that's a good, I'll, I'll, let, let me go with that one, and you know why? So who, who wrote A Boy Named Sue? I don't know. I've done Anybody that. know? No, I, I guarantee you heard his lyric. You heard that person's lyrics when you were a three, four, five year old boy, and your parents were re- were 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 reading you books when you went to when you went to sleep. Doctor Seuss, Doctor Seuss, Shel yeah. Silverstein. Oh, Shel, yeah, yeah. Shel Silverstein wrote like Shel the, where the ride right, where the sidewalk ends. That's where the that sidewalk guy. ends. He wrote Shel Silverstein oh, okay. wrote I'm, The Giving Tree. That's fine. But he's one of the great country music artists of all time. I had no idea. Huh. Yeah, so that's yeah. a that's a great that's a and and Cash made it kind of his own, but that's yeah. I'd go with a boy named Sue. I mean, that's a that's a really it's a legit deep good song. song yeah. yeah, it's a deep song. A hundred percent. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, reservation or just walk in? Walk in million percent. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that makes There's four of us. One yeah. person in this so, room. <laughs> they say this every time. So this is like an old joke now. If you ever listen to our things, here's why. Because if there's like four of us that kind of hang he, out, he likes families, to call so Chick Fil A. No, this is bullshit. <laughs> um, Okay, we, we go like say, okay. twelve deep, and yeah. they don't want to make a reservation. Then we're gonna be sitting there for two hours. Oh, we all have no, kids. No, 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 no. With so good when I make that you, No, I agree she with said, you. Great company. She said, she said walk in. Uh, uh-uh. she's a total reservation. No. Don't. She's that was untrue. Excuse what she me said. for a large. <laughs> <Very yeah. untrue. laughs> I appreciate it. If it's just my family, we walk in all the time. So, uh, <laughs> clarification had happened. Favorite uh, type of food. Uh, fish that I catch. Okay, you big offshore fisher. Uh. An amateur, very am- like extraordinarily amateur. But anytime I do catch a fish offshore, it's a big deal for me. And I, 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 I I'm very it. amateur too. And I, I don't have a boat at this moment or uh-huh. access to one really at this moment. But I've been, you know, in the past, you know, and it always amazed me that I could ever catch anything because I'm dragging four little tiny baits 20 miles offshore behind this 25 foot boat. How is it that I was ever, ever able to catch anything? Every, let me tell you, something, I have the exact same thought every time I catch a fish in like off the coast in Vero, like a white guy from Illinois can come here and kind of sort of try to figure it out. Um, I, I, have the, I have the exact same thought. I will say, though, having traveled, having been around, you know, having been all over, of all the places in the country where a guy that's kind of an amateur can go in and pretty much – you know, go out there and, and, and bring some stuff in and be an amateur. Florida is probably at, right at the top of the list. It is oh, it's one a, of the best places to fish, hands, hands down. Because you don't hands, really know what you're going after. You, you kind of have do. an idea, but, you know, I've been tarpon fishing in the Keys and offshore fishing and river fishing, but it's always a guess, really, what you're right. kind of going to get, and which is really it's fun. Whereas yeah. if you're trout fishing in streams up north, you're going to be trout fishing. Right. Um, yeah, but man. I I did always find that fascinating, like, the only thing I was really good at was burning gas. Um, I can burn the shit out of some gas. Yeah, in a man, boat. Like I can, I can waste gas like I, nobody's even, business. Even when I catch a lot of fish, I have the thought. I'm like, okay, for me to turn this into a productive <laughs> commercial endeavor. <laughs> I think oh, every dude, fisherman, like, I think every fisherman has this so, thought though. So I, I totally get it when you're out there offshore and you do see a commercial guy and they're like, you know, you, you might be kind of in his way and they're like, okay, get out of my way. You're like, okay, I get that dude. No problem, yeah. man. I'm, I'm going, yeah. I'm, yeah. it's, it's your game right here. Cause it's, and I mean, yeah. I actually know that's I, actually pretty cool of you. Cause a lot of people would be like, no. And I know, a, yeah, I know a commercial <laughs> you know I mean? guy. <laughs> I know a commercial guy really well. Actually, his parents are Judas fish house there in Sebastian, the oldest fish house in Florida. Yeah. yeah. But, um, they just sold actually. But, uh, and I always am amazed that they can make money because when I come back, I'm like, well, this dolphin cost $700 a pound. <laughs> 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 I could have just went to Publix right. and bought this. Right. Like, exactly, Anyways, man. I'm sorry. We we're way, you know, way off topic thoughts, here. Man, um, yeah. What kind of car do you drive? Uh, Chevy Silverado. Both Chevys. I appreciate yeah, that. Uh, beer, whiskey, or wine? Beer, million percent. Awesome. 
Nice. All right. All right. So, so you, you mentioned that you, you're both from Illinois. Is that no, accurate? No, no. I'm actually from South Florida. From South North, Florida? North yeah. Miami. Is that why you, you transplanted over? Oh, man. No, no. You want to get into that question? Sure. <laughs> well, Brett, tell him how you ended up in medical school in South Florida. Okay. <laughs> you guys ask me all these. We long met in medical school. Questions. We'll start with that. Okay. So I was a I majored in baseball in college. Okay. But I I had a chemistry major officially, and uh, my father was a physician. I played a, uh, after college. I played a couple years of minor league baseball, and then very quickly figured out that I needed to find a different way to make a living. So I went back, took some courses, and then took the MCAT, and I miraculously. To this day, I, I think God filled in a lot of the correct answers when I took the MCAT, <laughs> but I, I was able to get a good enough sore to get into medical school, and I saw that there was a school down in South Florida uh, in Fort Lauderdale, so I applied to go down to, to medical school in South Florida, and I got in, and that's where I met Felice. Nice. And what school is that? Nova Southeastern. Okay, okay. cool. That's yeah. awesome. And it yeah. was like for a kid from Illinois, like I, I remember I had interviewed at St. Louis University, and I'd interviewed at Southern Illinois. And then I go down to Fort Lauderdale in January and I'm in a coat and tie and I'm walking to the, to the, to the interview from my hotel. I'm, I'm walking and I started to sweat as I'm walking to the interview in January. And then after the interview, after the interview, I went to the beach and everybody's hanging out on the beach in January in Fort Lauderdale. It's like 78 <laughs> degrees. And I'm thinking yeah. to myself, if I get accepted here, I'm not going anyplace else. And I'm never going to leave the state of Florida. I don't think I'm ever going to leave the state of Florida. <laughs> hey, this listen, is, I don't disagree with you. you I've traveled quite a bit around the country, and I, I say time and time again, this is paradise to me. Paradise, so, man. oh yeah, yeah, it's it really funny is. because it's being I've been here since I'm a Central Florida kid, and then over here a lot, I, I take it for granted. You don't hit, the, I don't go to the yeah. beach like I used to, or it's well, you're so close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of start. So it's yeah. when you hear that story, it's nice to rem- a so, reminder. To, so have you have you two always wanted to be? I know you want to be a baseball player, right? <laughs> Essentially, like, like that was your dream right. job. What about you, Felice? Like, yeah. I knew you were going to ask this question tonight. I don't know. I, I thought they're going to ask me how I ended up becoming a doctor. Yeah. I actually walked, I went to University of Florida. That's where I got my undergrad degree. And I walked in wanting to be a lawyer. I thought All I wanted, right. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And I remember sitting there and they said, um, what's your major? You know? And I said, I don't know. And they said, well, what do you like? What do you want to do? I said, I guess I want to be a lawyer. And they said, well, then you're a criminal justice major. And I started off on that route, and I quickly learned that was not where my talents um, were. And so I started taking some science classes. I actually kind of got stuck in a science class. I was a psych major, and I got locked out. This was back in the day when you didn't go online to pick your classes. You guys probably remember. Yeah. I can't oh, yeah. be that much older than no, you. No, no, you no, You had no. to sit on a phone and just dial the phone over and over again to get and your classes punch in. in your numbers <laughs> for your class, which like anybody who that phone. was the computer back then. Yeah, that was <laughs> <laughs> the phone was the computer. And I remember just getting locked out of like all the classes I wanted. And I got stuck in this honest to God, um, uh, physiology, uh, psychology course. And so it was science course. And I thought, Oh, I'm going to just stink at this. This is, I'm going to struggle in this. All right, when I get in and I really did well and I really got it. And that was kind of, I got bit by the bug and I really like science. And from that, I just started taking science course after science course and just slowly found my way working towards nursing um, and had a very good friend say to me when I was, you know, and, 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 and that's a very admirable, admirable profession. I, you know, I'm not saying anything negative about it, but I had a friend who said to me, uh, who was a physician, he said, why don't you want to be a doctor? Why do you want to be a nurse? And I said, well, I just want to be a nurse. And he said, I'm going to tell you something. I think you want to be a doctor. And, and I think you don't think you can do it. And he was spot on. That was the truth. Um, and so I just started to change my course. And that's actually how I ended up in medicine. Huh. But from law to medicine is quite, you that's, know, that's, a big, that's a big jump. Yeah, because yeah. like, they're both really good professions. But complete opposite of the, you know beyond beyond that, that's awesome yeah Brett, but can she argue like a lawyer oh man Dude. Okay. <laughs> and, and win like a lawyer she's okay very, <laughs> <laughs> that's the important piece <laughs> she's extremely intelligent so very you guys met at nova southeastern then in yeah. medical school okay cool. yeah. yeah it was cool uh, you know my i've always had kind of a military bent so i 
the way I paid for my school was through what's called the Health Profession Scholarship Program. So as soon as I got accepted into civilian school, I got a, a scholarship from the Navy, and they just paid for my school, and they gave me a stipend to live off of. And this is because my grandfather was a Marine in World War II, and I just come from a military background. And uh, we were, I, I, I always remember she, she had kind of, we had met a couple of times here and there, and uh, we were at a Quiznos, and she was with a bunch of her friends, and she says, we were talking, this is, uh, it was like 2002. Yeah, 9-11. Came right out. after 9-11. And she says, she's like, uh, she says, uh, yeah, I lived in New York. I lived in Manhattan. I was going to NYU during 9-11. I was like, whoa, man. I was like, that's kind of cool. You know, and, and I don't, for whatever reason, you know, everybody else was kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, that, uh, that's cool. But her and I sort of had this immediate, um, it was more than a physical attraction. It was like, okay, hey, you're, you're cool. And we started, and not even like, uh, it wasn't even like we were trying to date or anything. It was a, an attraction, like a friendship, you know? Uh -huh. And yeah. so we started talking, kind of hanging out and, and, uh, man, one thing led to the other. We were studying together and now there's three, <laughs> three human beings. That are, you know, <laughs> in this world studying. Like, <laughs> studying together. Man. That is so, awesome. So would, yeah. did you have to serve for the Navy yeah. then? Yes. How's I that did. work? I did. So the way it works is that. As soon as I graduated from medical school, I owed them uh, years of service. It's year for a year. Um, so as soon as I graduated from medical school, I went active duty. But as soon as I went active duty, the, the Navy was training me as an anesthesiologist. And so I was, I was paying back my time for active duty, but then accruing more time because they were training me. So I, as soon as I graduated, I, I paid back my four years, but then because of the training, I owed four additional years. So I ended up being eight years of active duty oh, wow. and it worked out nicely because well, out we, of those, Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Out of those eight years of, of active duty, I spent two years with the Marine Corps. And the whole reason I joined the Navy is because my grandfather had been a Marine during World War II. And I wanted to, I wanted to be with the Navy because historically the Navy supplies the physicians for the Marine Corps. Oh. So I spent two years out of eight with, uh, with the Marine Corps. So well, we appreciate your nicely. service. Oh, thank definitely. you. For saying yeah. That. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Thank you for saying that. Man. That is fantastic. So all right, so you guys met in college and med school. Yeah. Med, med school. Med school. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. And, uh, what brought you to Vero beach? Oh man. Um, so I, I give a shout out to my boy. Who's my a partner in my group, uh, Chris Hollinger. Um, so I was uh, dead set on doing, after I finished my residency. Which, um, we, which we did in Virginia. Which we did and in we Virginia. Were there about I did in the seven military. Years. We, were, yeah. we were there. Okay. After I finished, um, I was dead set on either doing a fellowship uh, in, in what's called cardiac anesthesia or critical care. So you can do a fellowship. And when you finish, when you complete a residency training in anesthesia, there are, there are a series of about five or six things that you can then do a fellowship in. And I, I wanted to do either a fellowship in critical care or cardiac. And at that point in time, it was during the Obama administration, we were drawing down. So we were drawing down from Iraq. We were draw, we were, thought we were going to be drawing down from Afghanistan, all these kinds of things. So we were sort of fat everywhere within the, mm. the military. So nothing was being approved. So basically, I then didn't get the opportunity to do a fellowship and I stayed on as a general anesthesiologist with the thought that when I graduated, I just do the fellowship. I mean, not when I graduated, when I got done with my obligation, I would then just do the fellowship. So I get out of the military and I end up in a fellowship down at, at Jackson in Miami. And the problem with that is that I'd already been an attending physician for four years. And I, I, I had also deployed to Afghanistan. So I had a a lot of seasoning under my belt and now I'm back in a training situation and I've got two kids and I've got one on the way and this kind of thing. And it was just it, nothing bad about that program. It was just not the right fit for me. And so we kind of looked around and a, a spot had opened up in Vero beach to, to join the group. It was a group of private anesthesiologists in Vero beach. And I, I, I mentioned Chris Hollinger because I got out of my, my, I got out of work one day at Jackson and I walked over to the parking garage and I saw this ad and I called the number on the ad and it was Chris Hollinger on the other line. And we started talking. He says, Hey, you got to come up to Vero beach. Now again, I mentioned before I'm a white guy from Illinois. So 
I don't know the difference between Vero Beach and Miami. Right. It's all Florida to me, and it's all great, right? Gotcha. So I come like, man, I'm stop talking to him. It's this private group and a good hospital, and they're right by the beach. This sounds awesome. <laughs> you know, this is great. But I have to convince my wife because she's originally from Miami, grew up in Miami and Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> and anybody north of Jupiter is a redneck, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, dude, that was like the I never next. Said that. Uh, the next step. I mean, come on, man. So, so, so I had, so I, I came up and interviewed, and I'm like sold. I'm like, okay, this is done. That's a good job. You know, we she's gonna be happy. She, she, you know, she was kind of miserable with her job, et cetera, et cetera. She'll be happy. So we we rolled up here, and uh, and we're unbelievably happy that we made that. Now, decision. Felice, we you weren't her. in the military. Right. No, okay. I, so, so how'd that work for you with residencies and stuff like that? Because you're going through this at the same time. Correct? Yeah, I actually did a civilian, what we call a civilian residency. I did a civilian residency in Newport News, Virginia. Okay. He was, was in Portsmouth, Virginia. Okay. Which they're like, I mean, adjacent towns. So you didn't have a problem getting a residency like no, where, close I mean, to where he I was gotta at? I got to tell you, it was, um, I got very lucky because when we were in medical school, we got married in medical school, and then we had our first child in our fourth year of medical school. And I made the decision per a lot of, you know, a lot of advice from other female physicians that I had worked under as a medical student. They said, take this time now, you'll never regret it. So I took the year off with her, with my daughter, my first uh -huh. child. And then um, he finds out he's getting deployed to Japan on an unaccompanied tour, which means we can't go with him. Mm. And at the same time, I find out I'm pregnant with my son. Okay. Wow. So, and I'm holding a 10 month old baby <laughs> and I'm now, stuff. and I've put off residency for a year and now I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to start residency with two children under the age of two and a husband deployed in Japan. So I took a second year off. Okay. Oh, okay. So I took two, there was two years of a break between medical school and me starting residency. And we came very close to me not starting. I mean, I kind of was like, gosh, should I do this? I'm so far behind. I, I forget a lot of it. And something just told me, do it. You're going to really regret if you don't go oh, forward yeah. and do it. And I'm so happy that I did. Um, because in the beginning it was hard. I mean, I sat at like you know, morning report, which is very classic in, in residency, you do your rounds on your patients and you sit at a big table and everyone has to kind of go through morning report, discuss their patients, the cases they saw that day, et cetera. And I remember the language was very difficult for me to pick up because I had taken two years off and I was like, I'm going to get through this, you know, and I, yeah. I started the residency without him back from Japan. So I was alone for 14 months without him. And that was in Virginia? With two babies. In wow. Virginia? Yeah, I bought a so house, you, sight unseen. So you, you did, I assume you didn't have any family there or anything. I like. had she no family there. Out, I, yeah. she, I traveled. She I'll never it forget out. it. We got in the car. My mother came with me to help me move in, and I hired a nanny because I had to because yeah. I was going to sleep in the hospital every third night. Who's watching yeah. my kids? So I hired this nanny, <laughs> and she got in the car. <laughs> She's from oh, Miami. Man. Got in the car with me. We traveled up to Virginia. We drove up to Virginia. She didn't know a soul. I didn't know a soul. And we start. I started residency, and he, I'll never forget it. I, I went to the airport to pick him up. I was on a pediatric rotation in, in a hospital. So it was, um, what was it, Brett? CHKD, right? Oh, yeah, CHKD, CHKD was a yeah. hardcore rotation, like murderous. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I said, my husband's coming back from deployment. <laughs> Please don't put me on call the night he's coming back from deployment. Please. And lo and behold, I'm on call the night he's back <laughs> from deployment. And I beg, steal, and borrow for somebody to trade with me. And nobody Are will do it. Are you serious? I'm not oh, kidding. Man. Nobody will yeah. do it. I mean, Come one on. after the other. It's no, Virginia, no, so no, like, no. Here, like if you're ex-military... You know, I probably shouldn't say this on the podcast, but if a police pulls you over, oh, you're ex-military, you're good. Southeast Virginia? What are you talking about? Oh, everybody's everyone's military. military. It's like, get over so it. Your husband's coming back from uh, deployment. My husband's coming back from right. deployment. My, you know, so, like, so to them, it was an everyday thing. Everyone's husband's deployed. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, but is everybody's getting deployed or coming back? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like on yeah, that day? It's, it's crazy. Little, it's, so you know. here, listen. This one woman, I will never forget. I don't remember her last name. I just remember her first name. Her name was Megan. She was a pediatric resident, so she was above me. I was just an, an intern, and I begged everyone, and she 
said, I heard your husband's coming back. I'll trade. I'll take your call. I'm an intern. So she's, she's not supposed to take my call, right? So she's an upper level taking a lower level's call. She says, I'll take it. And I, at that moment, I realized Jesus is a white female. <laughs> <laughs> this woman is Jesus. <laughs> I love her. So anyways, it was great. I picked him up and I brought him home and I said, here's our house. And here's your walking, talking you know, son. So how long so how were you gone? Say, how long were you gone? I was I was gone for thirteen months in Okinawa. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So yeah. how'd you like Japan? I mean, I know yeah, your man. babies are growing no, up man. without yeah, you and your no, wife's at was, home. I, I, I mean that's some okay. so I was in Okinawa. Um have a lot of respect for the Japanese people. It was very interesting for me because my grandfather was a Marine in the South Pacific, right? So his you know, if you if you were to hear the way that he would speak about you know, that culture or those, you know, probably wouldn't jive with the way that we understand things in 2019. And that's a whole different perspective, right? Different perspective. Right. Uh, a lot of respect for, for the culture. There's a real respect mentality within their, their belief system. Um, Okinawa though, is kind of a whole different ball game. They're, they're kind of, it's an Island for those of, for people that don't know, it's an Island that's to the South of, of Japan and historically they're very ethnically uh, Chinese, Japanese, and even Filipino influence. Okay. So the thing is, is that when Japan started to expand in the early 20th century, they, they expanded onto Okinawa without the permission of the Okinawans. Um, and then we, we, the U S Marines fought a really uh, difficult and bloody battle in 1945 to take the Island back. And ever since then we've had a, you know, a presence. series of military a presence, a military presence on the island. And so um, the, uh, the Okinawa is not really considered to be like uh, mainland Japan. But I, I thought it was an incredible deployment. It's a very similar. It's almost the same latitude as like Vero Beach. So a lot of diving, a lot of fishing. Um, it, it was a tour that I would recommend to anybody. Um, it was just, it was tough being away from my family. Yeah. You know? Did you go yeah. to mainland at all while you're um, over there? I, I did not. I, I did a ton of exploring on the island and that's yeah. enough. It's believe it or not, the island's 25 miles by 75 miles. There's a lot to do. And there's sort of a big military presence in the South and central part of the island. But once you get away from that, it gets very, very, um, non-American and non-military very quickly. And that was kind of yeah. cool to try okay. to. I, I want to go to mainland. There's a couple of knife makers over there that I would love oh. to just go watch like them make some knives. Oh, like there's, there's a couple guys of, that I follow that are just like, yeah. but they, you know, their whole families have been doing it for hundreds, hundreds of years. Of years yeah. And yeah. They've got, there's so much tradition. the way they Smith stuff. And you know, it's just absolutely mm -hmm. like insane to me just to be able to watch somebody work. Absolutely. Steal in that way would be absolutely just yeah. a experience. Yeah. I feel yeah. Yeah. So it was a, it was a, overall, it was a very positive experience. Everything that you do in life, ultimately you have to look at it as a learning experience. And for me, it was a very, very, it was a positive experience. It was just difficult, uh, at the time, you know, uh, day our oldest was, uh, she was 17 months when I left. And then Matthew was a little baby and, and he was, I guess, what was he? 15 Se months or something. Yeah. Like he was that, seven right? weeks when you left. Yeah. Wow. Something like that. Yeah. 14 yeah. Is, months. is Okinawa kind of where maybe any of the longevity thought processes started? Oh, they're a blue dude. zone. That's they're a blue right. zone. And That's they right. have like, they uh, are a blue zone. You're, you, That's you right. get this. Okay. So in Oki, you will see when you fly onto the Island, you fly and usually you fly the, the flight path is from the South. So you'll fly onto the Island and you can see to the, from the South coast out into the ocean. You can, it's almost like flying over Illinois, except it's, it's seaweed fields in the ocean and you can see everybody's got a little plot of seaweed field of seaweed and they mine this, they, they harvest the seaweed and these people eat the seaweed. And so you'll see, you will literally see people that are hundred years old walking down the street as if they're 50 years old, like no pain. They communicate with everybody. There's no dementia. Yeah. They live a totally functional life. And I think the, the neat thing about medicine now is that you can go to a place like Okinawa and you can actually study the, what they're doing. You can actually look at that information and you can share it mm -hmm. You can say, Hey, what works for them? You know, uh, same way. Another place is the Island of Sardinia. Mm -hmm. They have like five times the amount of, of people that live over a hundred years old than we do here in the United States. Why is that the case? You know, and these are things that we should be asking 
And these are things that we should be trying to, to learn from and share. And, and implement, yeah. The, yeah. the neat thing about globalization is that we, we have that opportunity. You know? Yeah, no, that's a great point because a lot of times, um, yeah, I mean, you looking at it that way because a lot of times people will go to the doctor and they just treat after the fact and they don't really get out of anything. They don't get anything out of it except that I have to take a pill now. Right. Right? It's not I mean, like a lifestyle. Talk, yeah, I mean, not. so, and I'm going to let Felice talk because she's much more educated about this, but you are 110% correct. Our problem with what we call conventional medicine right now in the United States in 2019 is way too often we are intervening in disease states late. Okay. And what we should be doing is intervening in disease states early. In order to do that, it has to cause, there has to be a paradigm shift. How can I intervene in a disease state early if I'm not talking to you about your diet? Okay. But how can I talk to you about your diet if the insurance company only gives me 15 minutes to sit down with you and talk with you because they're only reimbursing me X amount and I have to pay for my rent. I have to right. pay for my lights. I have to do this. My loans. Or I'm working. My yeah. loans. Your I'm staff. For the, right. My staff. Or I'm working for the big corporate that says, hey, you have to see 40 patients in a day. Right. And so there almost has to be a rethinking of the way that we we do things is, is in, in what we call yeah. conventional health care. It needs to be more proactive instead of reactive in the, what we're yes. trying to do there. Yeah. Yeah. Million yeah. Percent. And, and I, I do hate the fact that insurance dictates. Beyond. Be, yeah. Yeah, and, and even when you have good insurance, they still dictate. Like my son, he had to get eye drops, uh, steroid eye drops, and and um, for whatever reason, that was like the only one in the market that we could find. That the doctor even told us, like, this is the only one. We went to the public's pharmacy, and they got rejected. It was two hundred dollars for the bottle a month, and they were like, yeah, we th- like the insurance kept on saying, go find another one, and we're like, this is the only one, and they're like, well, we're not going to cover it, right? But it's like stuff like that just kind of drives me nuts about insurance. It's like, all right, well, what what am I paying for? What you know? What are we doing? And and well, them the giving system, the and, system's broken. Well, besides that, right? But but then like, like them dictating like what you get paid, and you know that's just and how what you order, you right? Know, um, I'll, I'll tell you this. I I tell a lot of patients this, and I I you know not against conventional medicine. I mean, there's been amazing advances in medicine. Okay. Um, we're not going to die for, but from typhoid fever and things like that. But ultimately there is an indoctrination that starts very early. And I really truly use the word indoctrination that when we went to medical school, there is about, um, just a, and I wish your <laughs> listeners could see my hands, but a huge amount of, um, information on pharmaceuticals. So it's big pharma from day one, you better learn every medicine that you can give for every ailment. And if you looked at our education in medical school, and I can tell you any doctor can um, testify to this, you looked at our education on lifestyle, on dietary, it's a joke. Yeah. It's an absolute joke. Supplements, vitamins, non-existent. And it's probably the old school wild. food pyramid too. Right. So well, it's not right. Even a good exactly. One. Well, on top of that, you're, um, uh, unfortunately, like a lot of doctors, they work long days. It makes it really difficult, right? Even oh, to, yes. to have like a good lifestyle. Yeah right themselves yeah yeah so it, it's so difficult and so i was doing conventional medicine for a while um i am family practice trained so that's where my initial board certification um came from and then in residency i really enjoyed helping patients lose weight um and so i would sit there and counsel and i mean i'd have nurses rapping on the door like dr hockey you have like five patients waiting you got to get out and it was always with a patient that i was helping lose weight and i just loved helping them get to their optimal weights so i started looking into something called bariatric medicine and um i i had a very good friend who's a bariatric surgeon who was at the hospital i was training at and i said is there you know a spot for a family practice doctor and bariatric medicine and he said are you kidding me and i learned very quickly that surgeons like surgery (laughs) and clinic is a means to surgery so they have to do clinic to get to the surgery and a bari a bariatric physician like myself a medical bariatrician is their way to kind of have someone do the clinic for them and they get to do their surgery i learned that and he's still a very good friend of mine but i started looking into bariatric medicine and i did my board certification in that 
And over time, I was very happy in this area of medicine, but I always felt something was missing. I was pressed. I was pressed by the insurance companies. I couldn't spend the time counseling the patients. I wasn't getting reimbursed. And the hospital was getting very upset. They'd say, Dr. Hockey, you're not making your, your what we call in medicine, RVUs. A lot of patients don't know this, but there's a way that doctors get paid called RVUs. It's where you get bonuses, et cetera. And I wasn't making them because I was spending way too much time talking and counseling and not enough time pumping patients out. And I was like, gosh, this is like, I don't want to do this the rest of my life, you know? So I started looking into other avenues of medicine and that's kind of how I found what I'm doing now, really functional medicine, integrative medicine, health optimization medicine. But I had to say goodbye to insurance um, because I could not spend the time I wanted to spend, the quality time I wanted to spend with patients and truly actually make a difference for them. So why would somebody come see you guys now? And you guys are in a practice together now, correct? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. You want to explain well, a little yeah, bit no, about I mean, how we, we our are, practice, practice. We are in a practice so, together, but... So by, by convention, um, I'm an anesthesiologist. That's what I do most days and that's what I do you know when I when I wake up in the morning and and then and, and you know all, all day um, a couple of years ago I got involved with a friend of mine here in town his name is Jason Griffith and he's been doing uh, you know he graduated from UF and then he got a, his in his uh, nice. master's degree in microbiology from UF and he since that time about 20 years ago has been involved doing stem cells and um, originally he was working down south with a company that was harvesting stem cells from muscle and then they would inject the stem cell into uh, the anterior wall of patient's left ventricle which uh, in, in your heart the left ventricle is sort of the powerhouse part of your heart that's what pumps all the blood blood to the rest of your body so they would have these uh, patients would have these diseased scarred ventricles and they would inject these stem cells that they had culture expanded into the patient's anterior wall of their left ventricle, and they were having these phenomenal results. They went under in 2008 during the financial crisis. Long story short, he's been in the space for close to 20 years, and I got involved with him, and we've been doing adipose-derived stem cells here in town in conjunction with something that's called uh, platelet-rich plasma. And, and we've been doing that those uh, procedures for patients that have uh, osteoarthritis, uh, and we've been injecting that in, in joints. And what we found is that if patients were living an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, meaning for the most part healthy, for the most part eating clean, for the most part exercising, and they had osteoarthritis, if we did these procedures on them, they get better. However, even if patients get better, but they're not doing those things that I just mentioned, and they are uh, leading a pro-inflammatory lifestyle that maybe they continue to smoke or maybe they continue to embrace, you know, high glycemic index carbohydrate diet or they, they're stressed at work or they don't sleep. Any of the things that we're all subject to throughout different times in our life, if they're doing that, a lot of times they don't get better. And so that's where it kind of led me to believe like, hey, we need to not just do procedures. I need to bring somebody in here that's going to show people exactly what they need to do to optimize their health. So this includes um, diet, I think is the most important thing. And that's where she she's, I mean, you want to go, how, how detailed do you want to be? Do you want to count every count, uh, calorie? Do you want to be accountable for every single thing you put into your body? That's what she's, that's her forte. That's her, that's her wheelhouse, right? Um, and in addition to that, she does checks your hormones. There's an emerging body of data that suggests that even as early as in our 30s, our har hormones are no longer in an optimal range and that this is something that contributes to chronic disease as we age. And so that simply just by keeping hormones, bioidentical hormones, keeping hormones in the youthful range, so not abnormal, you're not, but just keeping hormones in a youthful range that there's an emerging body of data that suggests that this is a way to optimize your health and avoid inflammation. Uh, looking at inflammatory markers, things like, you know, CRP, some of these other things that you can measure in the blood that are sort of markers of overall inflammation, very nonspecific, but they could be a marker that you've got an active infection. They could be a marker that you've got endothelial a uh, endothelial damage. It could be a marker damage. that you've got cancer, any of these things. And so we're, we're, you track those things. Um, and then, and then, uh, you know, just looking at, uh, 
you know, um, um, you know, vitamins, vi- right. Supplements. All these things. So basically she's going to sit down with you for an hour and say, we want to optimize your health. And so if I have somebody that is coming in for a stem cell injection and let's say that they are very overweight and they're, they don't sleep. Uh, there's all kinds of other health problems they have in addition to osteoarthritis in their knee. I'm very upfront and honest with them. I'm like, listen, listen, we can do the stem cell injection and it's possible that I can help you, help you. But if I don't treat, if I don't address all of these other things, I'm not doing you any favors. You're going to be right back at square one because the reality is, is what's happening in your knee is also going on in your heart. It's happening in your brain. It's happening in your kidneys. And the whole point is, is we need to move you away from inflammation. We need to move you away from oxidative damage and we need to get you moving in the direction of health. And what happens? Not only are you more healthy, you're better at home, you're better at work, you're better with your family. Um, your, your overall functional status improves. And it's like, why don't we, that's what a doctor should be doing. Agreed. Right? Yeah. Trying that's to so actually true. heal you instead of just giving you a pill. Right. And I'm not, look, by the way, you were about two sentences in and I was like, oh, I need to make an appointment. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> and, I was then like, it, and then it was like 14 more sentences. I was like, oh, I still definitely. De- definitely, definitely. 30 sentences. All right. Where were um, you at? Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. Can still. I sign up so, now? Yeah. <laughs> right. Here, let me How make quickly you can I get in? I <laughs> well, yeah. like, 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 a simple, a simple thing to think about is like we, you know, there's, there's so much simple sugar in our diets yeah. and, and how often, you know, and it's not our fault. It's just the way that we're trained. It's Ugh. the way that we think about things as physicians. You'll have somebody go to the doctor and say, the doctor told me I got to lose weight. Well, the, the, but they don't the, tell you how. Most, no. most people don't know how. Right. And I'm convinced, you know, I don't know what the number is. There are certain people out there that they want to eat cheeseburgers and they want to watch wheel fortune and that that's fine I, I, you know if that's what yeah, you if that's want all to, you want i, yeah. I, I say this all the a, time if pushing carts at walmart makes you happy and that's the job title you right. want to have as long as you're happy doing that doing and it, do that sure same I'm, way right. yeah but i'm saying there's people that don't care about the infl- they, it's like hey i'm gonna do what i want to do and that's what i'm yeah but i really think in talking to people and getting out there there's a critical mass of people they may not be a hundred percent i don't think anybody's a hundred percent you know, but there's a critical mass of people that want this information and they'll use this information to help themselves. They don't yeah. have the information. So like if I come in and I start off my morning and I eat a bunch of donuts, okay, let's just use that as Sounds an delicious. It's very it's delicious. Good. It's good I, for I'm about not, 30, 30 minutes. Um, I love donuts. I'm not, I'm hey, not, good donuts though. I'm, we don't want no I'm Dunkin' right, Donuts. I, okay. know, we want Krispy <laughs> Kreme. Right, I knew you were going to say Krispy that. Krispy Kreme, okay? Krispy Kreme donuts, man. Oh my God. I agree, man. What, what, <laughs> what, what about... I apologize to everybody. I'm not trying to be the... What about Tastio? Yeah, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, Tasio is okay. <laughs> what? Yeah. No? Yeah. Right. Not Dunkin'. No. But if you eat no. the donuts. <laughs> but if you eat the donuts, your blood sugar shoots through the roof, right? Yes. When your blood sugar shoots through the roof, your insulin shoots through the roof, okay? When your insulin gets to a certain level, it inhibits a, a hormone in your body called glucagon. Glucagon is the most lipolytic, so it's the most potent fat. fat-burning molecule in your body. So insulin in, inhibits that from working. And once insulin gets to a certain level, it starts, it's only builds fat. It doesn't build muscle. It doesn't build, it only builds fat. So it's, it's anabolic for fat. And then what happens is insulin gets to a certain level and it pushes glucose into your cells. So your body's level of glucose, available glucose drops, and then you get hungry again. And most people then repeat the same process. And you stay in that but level of just a, producing right. fat and yeah. storing exactly. fat. Right. And on top of that, that's right. Storing fat. Exactly. So what happens is that then your insulin levels are always high and your tissues develop something called insulin resistance. And so when they develop insulin resistance, that means they don't respond to the insulin. So as a consequence, your resting levels of blood sugar stay high. That excess blood sugar gets converted into triglycerides. Those triglycerides are what begin all of the oxidative damage inside your your organ systems. We call that, you see it, you see it when in, in some of you call that metabolic syndrome. It results in arresting high blood sugar, resting um, hypertriglyceridemia, uh, unwanted belly fat, insulin resistance, and and that's the thing that basically leads to all of this disease. So if we simply just avoid high glycemic index carbohydrates, that's just 
a tiny little thing that we can do to, to avoid disease. So when someone comes in, I know like keto, for example, is very popular right now. It's, it's the big buzz. Is that something that you guys push or do you got to go individualize? Because I know some I people try to stay away from the labels because not, you know, it becomes I, a fad where I you don't work, want it to be a fad. Yeah, I work with patients with all different dietary plans, et cetera. I have patients who are like, I'm doing keto right now and I'll work with them. But I will tell you, my main dietary approach is, is very much a very a flexible dieting approach. So all macros are welcome. <laughs> Protein, carbs, and fats. That's a great okay. t-shirt, by the way. Yeah. If you don't have that, you should make that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All macros are all welcome. Macros I'm just are saying. Welcome in my world. Um, so, and I will work with patients in, str- in terms of strategies to help them kind of pass pass plateaus because every patient in terms of weight mm-hmm. loss or weight optimization will hit plateaus. It's just, it, that's actually a normal part of weight loss. And I have, if you, if you approach it and tell them to expect that, it's easier when it comes and they're like, okay, I'm in that plateau. And I'm like, okay, let's come up with a strategy to get you past it. Cause there's a lot of tricking of the body to get you to your weight optimal goal. Um, but I don't necessarily p- push a keto or anything. I really do do more of a flexible dieting kind of macro approach. Um, and it really depends on the patient. I yeah. have patients who are starting at square one. They're eating fast food every day. They don't know where to start. And I have other patients who are really fit, like Wendy Rob patients who are like, hey, take me and make me better. Those That's, are, those you probably, are, I think you probably enjoy that because vision. now it's a big puzzle. Should you, should you choose because to accept it. the first yeah. one is just cure to fast food and you're going to be I, on stage yeah. step s- one. I can only see six of my ab muscles. Can, can I see <laughs> right, eight? Right, I want eight. <laughs> right, <laughs> like those patients, yeah. I get like, I get a little, like I hyperventilate. I'm like, okay, this is a challenge. Um, but it's kind of interesting. A lot of patients will ask me, what, what do I notice in laboratory that will delineate like a really fit patient from a patient who's not? And I'm going to tell you, honestly, it's not testosterone. It's not growth hormone. And um, we don't really look at actual growth hormone levels. We look at something called IGF levels. But insulin, observationally, yeah. I will tell you, the absolute leanest, fittest patients have the lowest insulin levels. I mean, talking Interesting. one um, and you know, when you start getting into 25, 26, that's where you have diabetes. Okay. So th- just to tell you the difference, um, and I've just, that's just something I noted in my, in my work observationally. So it's really interesting. That's, yeah. That's well, very interesting. I, and I think personally, I mean, I think sugar is, you know, the number one drug in America anyways, you know, I can't stay away from it. Oh, I can't yeah. put it down. Like, yeah. I'm. And if it's in my house, scene, I, like, I automatically get the insulin spike, like, like, yeah, like the drop where I'm like, I'm hungry. Yeah. And, yeah. and immediately my, my brain is like, yeah, I'm hungry right now. Yeah. And Let I me mean, we're all pretty well educated. I mean, not nearly what you guys no, are, but no, we no, know yeah, what we should be sure. eating and shouldn't be eating. But it doesn't stop me from that's stopping. Being, yeah, like that's been so like, like my, my favorite things is reading up on nutrition and all the different like paleo and all like all those like. And whole we've foods, done whole 30 and, yeah. and we've and done, you know, but, ketos. And so like, I know exactly what to do. sucks. Yes. Yeah, it was the worst. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it, it is. Oh, it is. I, it's, what's the weirdest, the, the, the shittiest part is it didn't take me that long to go right back to where I was. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's why? Strange, I felt so good. But when you get off, it's like you feel really good. Your energy levels are up. It's only 30 days in. So imagine doing it for 60, 90 and letting it become where now you only come off of it for like special occasions. My, um, yeah. But yet, and so my heart life strange. took over. And, um, yeah. Yeah. What was the weirdest thing for me? Like when I got my fittest, I... I went on the zone. I was like pretty strict for a while. Like I dropped down to like 179, which is really lean for me. And then, and um, I was lean. I, I felt great. Um, I remember I went out and I hadn't had like any alcohol for like four months. And I was like, I went out with uh, a friend of mine and I had my first beer and I was like, and it was a Bud Light. And it, all I could taste was the alcohol. Like, like it was a so, shot. Yeah. I was like, this is weird. <laughs> like, like it was a weird <laughs> thing a ever for me. <laughs> and it was a Bud Light. And, but, like an idiot, I powered through it, <laughs> and I was like, "This will be fine." <laughs> and then here I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. I, you know, and this is her wheelhouse. But I would say, I, I, you know, and I hear a lot about this too. And I'm again, I'm simply just uh, an anesthesia. I'm a gas passer. But the thing is, is that literally we have we have, <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have you know we have keto, we have paleo, we have whole thirty, you have the South Beach diet got the zone diet you have all these different things i personally think it might be we may find out in the future that hey your body type and your genetics predispose you to having better results for paleo let's say okay we might figure that out in the future i do think though the key to all of these things is avoiding 
the processed garbage mm-hmm. yes. and avoiding the stuff that's that's high glycemic index carbohydrate. I think that is the key. And then having an understanding of what are the things that are high in antioxidants. If I'm not getting enough of those antioxidants, who, what do I need to supplement with? Omega threes, vitamin D, vitamin C, all those kinds of things. And you, you know, your point about alcohol. I mean, you guys were cool enough. You guys have craft beer here in your oh, refrigerator. Yeah. So I, I'm post call. You guys <laughs> offered me a beer, and I said, "Hey, no problem." N- next time you come, there'll next, be more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you up on it. But you know, the thing is, is like I don't think. If you enjoy doing something, I don't think you should deprive yourself right. of it. It's just moderation. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Agreed. So, yeah. I mean, if you're yeah, sitting there having four IPAs every night, hey, man, that might be a problem. But to have a glass <laughs> of wine or two, I mean, I always tell people, man, if you're a surgeon or you're an anesthesiologist and you're and, and somebody tells you, hey, I don't have I don't drink at all. I don't know, man. I'm not sure if you should even trust that person. <laughs> <laughs> you got to upregulate that GABA, man, because you're coming home and you're like, whew. Oh, man. That was, we don't that know a lot of doctors who don't drink. Just yeah, I it's, it's stressful. It's, it's stressful. It's, 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 you know, I had a, I don't know how true this is. I had a buddy tell me that, um, that it, you know, he's a, my insurance guy, and he was telling me that, that uh, and that maybe he was just rationalizing how much he was charging me for the insurance. But he told me disability was the one of the highest for for anesthesiology, and I I don't know if that's true or not, but yeah. I can Interesting. just say it's, yeah. it's, it's it, you know and and it's it's there's a lot you know there's a lot and everybody I mean it's what we I mean you know it's it's you mentioned you're a teacher mm-hmm. I had a I had a I had a friend of mine who was a mentor of mine in Okinawa, and this guy was so cool he's like sixty at the time he was like late sixties. His name was Brock Fallon, very dear friend of mine. And he, I got to Okinawa, he's a, men, he's a mentor, you know, he's, we, we kind of had Bible study together and a lot of these different things. And he says, he says he's been an engineer his entire life. He would, he, he, he was in the West and he would go down and he would dive down and, 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 and to like 150 feet in these deep ravines and check the structural integrity of these bridges, right? So then he gets out to Okinawa and he's out there with his wife and he says, hey, I, I don't have a job. I guess I'll just teach uh, calculus and physics at the high school. So she said, oh, Casually. Why not? He was an engineer who knows <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yes. So he says the first day he gets out there and he stands up and he says, uh, man, he goes, I've been an engineer for my whole career and I'm really looking forward to having a nice relaxing uh, job and I can't wait to have three months off in the summer and get off every day at three o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon. And he says exactly. He says the, the the entire room started to snicker and laugh because he was serious, you know. Yeah. And he sits down and he's kind of confused. And he sits down and he goes a year later. He's like, "Holy mackerel!" He goes, "Teaching is the hardest job, <laughs> hands down. I'll put that up against anybody." Yeah. He says, "Nice. You are never off." I, I couldn't do it. My wife's a teacher too, it's and incredible. there's no way. I, did, I got so much absolutely respect. no way. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, and so I guess the point is what we say at RBI is we say it doesn't. Everybody's stressed, man. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're trying to support your family, you're stressed. So you should treat yourself like a professional athlete. Stress. Yeah, and that's actually that's one thing that point. we always say is stress is relative, right? Yeah. Um, and so what may be a stress for me may not be a stress for you and vice versa. Right. But that so, doesn't yeah. mean it's any less stressful no. for me or any less stressful not for at all. him. You know, it's right. A yeah, agree. Percent, man. Well, so where can people find you? Well, we are... Like if we want an appointment with you guys, how, how do we... Sign up for that. Or, or when Don't when ask do me it. our telephone number. I'll have to Google it. But we're <laughs> <laughs> I can pull it up. Well, do, does anyone memorize numbers now? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, we just Google it. We Google it. it. So just oh the God, name. No, we'll Google it. They'll get the number right so there. Are, Hit the so call button. We're, I, I do know our address. So we're Regenerative Biologics Institute. We're right off 37th. We're kind of near where the hospital okay. is. And okay. I guess people call Dr. Rowe. Um, and we're 3730 7th Terrace. Um, and... Uh, we're very easily found. You can Google my name. Our last name is interesting. It's hockey like the sport, but it's spelled H A A K E. So um, okay. we're we're easily. I'm very Googleable. Okay. Now <laughs> now, do, do you guys have like a Facebook page? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, so, you start a blog, right? So, yep. So Regenerative Biologics Institute does have a Facebook page, and then we also I started up a blog with past guests of yours. Yes. Um, Rob and Wendy, and it's called Just Stop the Clock. 
and it's um, kind of geared for the 40 plus crowd. Anyone can obviously utilize it for its information, but it is geared for the 40 plus crowd in terms of fitness, um, diet, um, anti-aging. So it's really kind of the latest you know, research out there. It's, it's fun. And there's a lot of and, good and blogs. Just before you guys go, what does the first appointment look like? If somebody just come in like, Hey, listen, I want to stop the clock. Yeah. And they come, they come in. And, <laughs> I like how you yeah, just threw yeah. that in there. <laughs> um, so a first appointment, uh, I, I often tell patients, we tell patients expect um, to spend at least an hour uh, I oftentimes, if a patient doesn't know that, I see them looking at their clock, their watch, and I say, do you have to go? I'm sorry. Am I holding you? And then that's not usually typical. Yeah. They're, they're used to, yeah. you know, 15 minutes with a doc. So we spend at least an hour. Um, I do a lot of intake. So it's, you know, their past medical history, who they are, what, what, what they're, you know, coming to see me for, what the main reason for seeing me for is. Um, if they're looking for weight optimization, we go through an entire dietary teaching, lifestyle, um, education kind of process as well. Um, we have a scale that's called an in-body scale. I don't know if you guys have ever been on one or mm -hmm. seen one, but it's basically a bioelectrical impedance scale. And what it does is basically show your body composition. Ooh, it's, second to a DEXA. Right it's second to a DEXA, <laughs> which is the gold standard for body composition. Oh, wow. DEXs are very, very expensive machines, and uh, is, in body is right below that. Is that the one that they put you in a tank? Oh, that's that. That's different. Um, okay. But but ultimately, this is those are the gold standards. Okay. This is second to that, Got and it. it's very close. Um, you, you know, I have some bodybuilders and fitness, you know, um, models and people like that who know their body fat, like they know it, and I get them on the scale, and they're like, "Wow, that's like within one to two percent." you know, body fat. Okay. So it's, it's got that kind of error. So it's I'm, very, very close. I'm going to wait to jump on that. Yeah. No, oh no, oh no, you will get on that. <laughs> get on that yeah. Oh no. I think one, this is a good video. <laughs> we'll all go down yeah. and get on the yeah, scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, and <laughs> That's then, true. I agree. Yeah. And then oftentimes I order comprehensive labs. Um, so I have kind of a laboratory panel that I look at. Uh, do, like, he, like Brett said, I do hormones. Um, I, I look at a full thyroid. I definitely go a little bit outside of the box of what your conventional physician orders, um, and nothing against them. I, I used to do it. You feel very kind of, uh, ruled by the insurance companies. And, and so we don't do that. And I use a lot of codes to help get it covered by your insurance. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, so we kind of go above and beyond. One, one thing that I think we should clarify is that, um, you know, so she spends an hour with patients and because of that, we don't accept insurance. But one thing that we do do is we will actually bill your insurance for you. So we will fill out the paperwork and do it for you. And then additionally, people that have said, no, I'll do it myself. We've had anywhere from like 60 to 100% reimbursement. So it's not like you can't use your insurance. We're just simply saying, hey, we want to spend an hour with you. We can't do that if we're required to sit here and submit all this stuff. To yeah. So what, gotcha. what we usually tell the patient is if you have insurance, um, absolutely. We understand you pay for that and you want to utilize it. You are welcome to call your insurance companies. There's an easy form that's filled out. It's literally a stamp filled out and we give you an encounter form with all my billable diagnosis codes. It gets submitted. And I would say of the patients who are taking advantage of that, which I have a few, it's they're getting at least 65 to 100 percent reimbursed, meaning a check comes in the mail and they stick it right back in their bank account. Okay. So I just personally have cut myself out of the insurance equation because I just I want to be able to spend as much time with the patient as as I can. Yeah. Well, and that that puts you doing what you actually want to do and need yeah. to do instead of what the insurance company and wants you to do. Exactly. And for me, that's bigger than anything, because now you're kind of just like. I'm going to call the shots here, guys. And as someone that wants That's to come to I go feel. to a place, yeah. I feel like that makes me want to go there more than someone Absolutely. else. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Um, we like to always ask an ending question, and it might be two different answers. They might coincide. But based on your experiences, what is one of the most important pieces of advice that you can give our listeners that they could implement tonight, tomorrow morning? And it could be anything. So. Gosh, one, you're going to make me narrow it down. Honestly, the first <laughs> thing that comes to my mind is – is looking at your life and looking for areas where you can decrease your inflammation. Um, I, I, I tell patients to look at any inflammation going on in their body when we get their labs back as a little fire, okay, a little fire going on, and anything that you can do to throw water on that, um, whether it's, um, you know, dietary, lifestyle, um, exercise. I mean, and I, you know, I, I, I look at this as spokes of a wheel, there's psychological, there's social interactions, dietary, exercise, lifestyle, medical, 
all of these things. And if you address all of them and you can bring down your inflammation, you'll, you'll probably extend your life lifespan. Wow. wow. Um, so mine is going to be a little different, a little more, uh, not related to medical, but, um, contrary to like a lot of the stuff that's out there now, especially for kids, I, I think that it's important to kind of really dive into history and understand that like anytime you want to accomplish something that's difficult or that's really good or it's really um, uh, worthwhile. worthwhile, it's going to be really difficult. It's going to be really, really difficult and just expect it. And I mean, you can just pick the people in history that have had to, that have achieved great things. And this is, this is a ubiquitous theme. Um, so just, just, I think that there's sort of a myth out there now that, Hey, uh, things are easy and I can just, and the, my, the whole goal in my life is to achieve pleasure and to, to choose the path of least resistance. But that path to what's worthwhile is oftentimes the, not the, not the easy path. So I don't mm. think that Amen that's to that. Great answer. You always yeah. has to one up me. No, oh, I think they're both great not answers. one up. You put those two together <laughs> in there and you can't we, make we, much better. We could, do a lawyer, we could do a lawyer thing. Do you want a rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Will, awesome. L- listen, that was fantastic advice. I yeah, really appreciate that. You. We appreciate oh, it, guys. Sure. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Guys, please share our stuff on social media. <laughs> if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, you can email us at fullgrillalife at gmail.com. And if you want to Stay on track and see what's going on in our neck of the woods on social media. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. At Instagram and Facebook, you can go at Full Gorilla Life and on Twitter at Gorilla Full. Like beautiful, but with a gorilla. Last but not least, please do not forget to visit our website. If you have any questions or any concerns, you can visit us at Full Gorilla dot life and please do not forget to hit subscribe on your podcast app of choice you guys are horrible we nailed it boom